good morning to everybody uh, we are a little bit uh, <clears throat> late today uh, uh, during last uh, two sessions we discussed the uh, uh, seal uh, virtue uh, as described in the buddhist discourses and also in the uh, in the visuddhi manga now uh, Today we will look at uh, key ethical concepts in uh, Buddhism. Uh, when we study uh, ethics, it is very important for us to understand the uh, basic ethical concepts, the concepts <coughs> uh, that are uh, that we come across uh, in the Buddhist tradition. And uh, I'm sure you are familiar with. Uh, most of these concepts but we will uh, uh, look at them a uh, little bit in detail uh, there are many ethical concepts or terms in buddhism among such terms the two pairs of concepts punya and papa good and evil and uh, kusala and akusala wholesome and unwholesome are prominent all these concepts are generally translated into english as good and bad and treated as more or less synonymous without making an adequate distinction. Now, not making a clear distinction between these two sets of concepts could lead to some wrong interpretations. As Professor R. D. Premsri has pointed out, as Tachibana's ethics in early Buddhism contains such a misinterpretation. Now, um, uh, this uh, small uh, book uh, all of you have got. In fact, um, my next uh, two or three sessions uh, uh, pretty much uh, are based on this uh, uh, small book. So I think it is good for you to read the whole book very carefully, okay? Uh, but uh, I will be using uh, some aspects of uh, uh, discussions of this uh, book. Now, one important discussion is uh, distinguishing between uh, uh, Punya Papa and Kusala Kusala. Now, when we read Buddhist literature, we come across these terms. We talk about Punya and Papa, and also we talk about Kusala and Akusala. However, generally these uh, terms are translated into English good and bad. Now, in ethics, we talk about good and bad. However, when we look at Buddhism, we see that especially these two sets of terms, there are other terms also, like uh, sadhu, asadhu. Uh, again, good and bad. But uh, we need to be very careful when we uh, try to understand these concepts because uh, when we talk about uh, punya papa, we refer to certain types of good actions. But uh, when we refer to kusala and akusala, we refer to somewhat different types of uh, uh, good actions. Now, in my last week discussion, uh, I uh, pointed out how to make the distinction between good and bad than uh, uh, right and wrong. When we say something to be good, uh, we mean one aspect is good means something desirable, something we like. Also good means something ethically and morally good and appropriate. So. In our day-to-day -day, uh, usage, when we use in the term good, uh, we are not always making a distinction. But of course, we, we must really see that when we say something is good, we, we mean that it is good, something good to eat, something good to drink, uh, like that. So something desirable, something we like, so good and bad. Um, at the same time, we are using good and bad to refer to uh, good and bad behavior, good and bad actions. 
okay now ethical meaning ethical significance is uh, somewhat different from the other meaning okay and then when we talk about right and wrong in fact uh, we are talking about uh, something different right and wrong basically we are talking about the behavior right things and wrong things to do so um, the connection between the two is something very important okay connection between the two is something very important now for example sometimes in uh, uh, ethical uh, behavior we first discuss uh, determine or define what is good for us and then accordingly we next decide what is right and wrong okay we first decide what is good and bad and then we think okay in order to get this good thing this way of behavior is right so rightness sometime we understand to depend on what we consider to be good and bad okay so we will come to this point uh, again and again so in here when we read buddhist literature it is very important for us to see the difference between punya papa and kusala kusala now basically when we talk about punya papa we are talking about punya kriya uh, usually translated in english as uh, meritorious deeds and then we accumulate merit we acquire merit in order for our uh, for us to be born in uh, heaven sagga so when we take sagga as uh, one um, uh, goal of life in order to achieve that we are talking about uh, punya and then papa is opposite if you do papa uh, we believe that we are going to be born in apaya or niraya hell so um, so punya papa is basically connected with uh, sagga however the when we talk about kusala kusala this kusala akusala these two terms uh, in fact uh, found basically in the teaching of the buddha punya papa you also find in other indian religions particularly in the vedic religion in the brahmanic tradition you find concept of punya and papa okay punya papa is uh, in that sense uh, pre buddhist it was already existing in the society the idea that um, you know certain things are good and certain things are bad ethically and also these good and bad things are uh, related to your next life how you are going to be born so basically this is the understanding now in buddhism we also have concept of punya papa however uh, mm. in buddhism we also have as a goal mokha sagga and mokha sagga is heaven mokha is liberation now there can be two different emphases now certain things we do can be good for sagga or if we do the opposite of those things we will be leading to niraya or apaya that is one aspect and then certain other things will be conducive or good for nibbana attaining the liberation okay so uh, you know this distinction this division is something very important because uh, in the uh, literature sometimes punya papa kusala akusala are used without much uh, um, this distinction so you you talk about punya papa you talk about kusala akusala but uh, it seems that uh, people understand both the same in fact uh, in the even in the ancient literature you can see that these two concepts have been uh, used um, uh, interchangeably so sometimes they talk about punya sometimes they talk about kusala but they mean the same thing however if you look at carefully you can see that there is a distinction there is a difference between these two sets of concepts now uh, look at the last paragraph not making a distinction between do, 
two sets of concepts could lead to some wrong interpretations. Now, as Professor Premsari has pointed out in this uh, small uh, book, mm -hmm. as Tachibana's Ethics in Early Buddhism contains such a misinterpretation. Now, this book, as Tachibana, Ethics in Early Buddhism, actually this is a fairly old book. I think this was written in uh, 1950s, last century, maybe uh, 50, 60 years old, I am not exactly sure. Uh, so, this is a very early uh, books on uh, Buddhist ethics. Now, uh, Tachibana thinks that we will, okay, we will look at what is uh, uh, Tachibana's uh, uh, interpretation on uh, Kusala and Nakusala. Now, the enlightened person in Buddhism is beyond good and evil. Uh, okay, this is uh, Tachibana's view. Enlightened person in Buddhism is beyond good and uh, evil. Uh, that is his view which means enlightened person is arahant or you can say the Buddha or any arahant is enlightened person. Now enlightened person is beyond good and evil. What do you mean by beyond good and evil? Uh, it means that uh, when a person becomes an arahant, for him good and bad or good and evil uh, do not apply. Do not apply mean, actually he is, uh, the, he doesn't have to care about. You know, he reaches a state where it doesn't really matter what he does. You know, something like that. So when you say a person is uh, beyond uh, good and evil, so the good and evil, you know, these uh, uh, aspects that we see in the social life are not applicable to him. So, when, when you become an arahant, it means that uh, you can do anything, you know, something like that. Uh, or it could mean that uh, you are in such a high position, what is applicable to ordinary people uh, is not applicable to you. Now, we say ordinary people um, uh, have to behave, say, for example, observing five precepts and uh, that type of basic uh, morals. But this idea is that when you become an arahant, these basic morals are not applicable to you. Okay. Now, you know, this is something uh, very uh, important for us to understand correctly. Because uh, according to Buddhism, when you become an arahant, whether you reach a status uh, which is beyond good and bad, is, you know, something uh, problematic. Now, if we take, for example, in day-to-day -day life, sometime we, in, in our ordinary life, we say that there are certain things, um, we say to small children to do those things. But we don't do them. Maybe when children ask them why you don't do it, we say we are adults, we don't have to do it, you know, something like that. That means that there are certain things in ordinary society, uh, which may not be applicable to grown-up people, you see. And uh, it is in a way justifiable. There are certain things we say that, no, small children should not do these things, okay. But what about big people? We say, oh, big people is okay, you know, something like that. In society, very often, if you see a small child smoking, we will say that that is wrong. But when a grown-up person is smoking, we will not say that. But of course, we know that smoking is not good for anybody, right? But still then, if a very small child smokes, we say that is not good. But then when an adult smokes, we don't say that is bad, although it could be bad for your health. Now, you know, that type of distinction, there are certain things only good for small children, not for adults. Now, this is something like that. There are certain things not good when you are an ordinary person. But when you become an arahant, those things are not applicable. Now, this is Estachibana's view. Whether this is the right view about Buddhist uh, ethics, whether this is the right view about arahant uh, uh, ethical and moral status, is something very important for us to think. Okay, uh, here I am uh, uh, 
uh, quoting from Professor P.D. Premasiri in this uh, small book, you have got it in the page three, you have that the bhikkhu, the brahmana, the buddha, satha muni are said to be free from such distinctions as good and evil, pleasantness and unpleasantness, purity and so on. When one reaches this state of culture, distinctive ideas will be absolutely abolished. Distinctive ideas means uh, uh, ideas, categories of distinction, good and bad, right and wrong, beautiful and ugly, um, and so on. Uh, absolutely abolished. He has reached the mental condition where there is no consciousness of moral, aesthetical, or logical distinction. The relative ideas, therefore, of good and evil, pleasure and pain, agreeable and disagreeableness, right and wrong, are all annihilated for him. Now, uh, this is actually uh, Tachibana's idea about Arahan. Now, read that section carefully. Is this the situation of an Arahan? Uh, is it true to say that an Arahan uh, is really doesn't have to uh, care about uh, distinction like good and evil, pleasantness and unpleasantness, purity and impurity. You know, is, it, is that correct? And also towards the end of this quotation you have, uh, he has reached the mental condition where there is no consciousness of, no consciousness, no idea of moral, that means good and bad, Aesthetical, that means um, beautiful and ugly, uh, or logical distinctions. And then um, logical distinctions means, you know, the, 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 whether certain ideas are consistent, certain ideas are contradictory, and so on. And relative ideas, therefore, of good and evil, pleasure and pain, agreeableness and disagreeableness, right and wrong. So, is it correct to say that Arham doesn't care about right and wrong? When you become an Arham, does that mean that Arham doesn't care about right and wrong? Now you see, we know that this idea is not correct. Because Arham thought this, when you become an Arham, you are really morally perfect person. When you are morally perfect person, you really care about what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. So you can't say that Arham really doesn't uh, care about. But later I will show you, uh, Tachibana says this because he understood certain things about Punya Papa related to Arham. That I will explain to you later. But you know, this is one. Now, if you really understand the distinction between good and bad and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Punya Papa and Kusala Kusala, then we will not say that. But of course, why he says this is because uh, at some point uh, we will see in detail, we say that Arahant is beyond Punya and Papa. But of course, Arahant is not beyond Kusala and Nakusala. Okay? Now, there is such a distinction, but simply because he has misunderstood this distinction, uh, Tachibana seemed to think that, you know, there are certain things, uh, uh, good and bad, right and wrong, these things are not applicable to Arahan. Now, one more reason why some people think, uh, you remember in, when I was discussing at the very beginning about religion, I told you about some distinction between esotericism and exoterism in religion. There are certain things internal and there are certain things external. Now, sometimes in religious traditions, people believe that uh, there are certain things when you reach a certain stage, it's okay for you to violate or okay for you to do. For example, when you are a small novice or when you are a big monk, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, the, there are certain things big monks can do, but small monks cannot do, right? Yes. <laughs> in, the, in the practice, we have that type of thing. But actually, if you think, if you take the winner, yeah, you know that monastic vinay doesn't recognize whether you are a big person or a small person. Whether you are an arahant or putujjana even. If you take the vinaya, vinaya rules, you can be after upasampada one vasa or you can be after upasampada sixty vasa. 
So big difference. But you don't have two Vinayas. Vinay is only one, right? Vinay is only one. So there is no distinction between Vinaya. You can you cannot say that, okay, I'm a big grown up, you know, I can do certain things. So, you know, you can't do certain things. No, Vinaya is the same thing. Now, interesting thing is, there is no Vinaya distinction even for an Arahan. Even if you are an Arahan, you can't say that I'm an Arahan, so I don't have to observe Vinaya. No, not like that. You know, there are certain things. I think you know this story about Vendable Mahakachana. Vendable Mahakachana one time did not go to do the Uposatha. Because he thought that, you know, he is purified, he is an Arahant. He doesn't need to go to Uposatha. Now, this is an Arahant. I mean, no, not going to Uposatha is not a, not a um, big offense. But then Buddha said that, Kachana, if people like you don't go to this, who else is should go. Because idea is that even if you are an Arahant, the Vinay rules are applicable to you, right? So that means in Buddhism, you don't have a um, um, situation where, um, you know, you, you don't observe Vinay rules or anything, okay? So this is something very important. Now here you can see that the idea is that um, when you become an Arahant, the Bhikkhu, Brahmana, Buddha or Sattva Muni, said to be free from such distinction. So this is a wrong idea because uh, in Buddhism. Now, uh, what I would like to show you is, uh, in fact, um, um, the basic distinction between Kusala and Nakusala and Punya Papa have to be distinguished uh, accurately, okay? So uh, otherwise you uh, come into this type of um, uh, wrong views. The concepts Punya Papa are from pre-Buddhist Brahmana tradition and refer to ethical and moral actions in general. The concepts Punya Papa are from pre-Buddhist. I uh, mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, these ideas come from pre-Buddhist tradition. Now they refer to uh, moral actions. Now uh, we know that by the time Buddha was born in uh, India, the Brahmana religion was the practice. And in the Brahmana religion, they, they believed in uh, what is called Punya, Punya Karma. In Sanskrit, we say Punya and then uh, Papa. So believed, they believed in uh, Punya Karma. Now Punya Karma, they thought, will help them to be born in, the, in, in heaven. So this is the basic belief. So this basic ethical concept that was existing in the Indian society, Buddhism accepted, okay? So, Punya, Punya Papa is pre-Buddhist Brahmana tradition and refer to ethical and moral actions in general. In the teaching of the Buddha, these concepts similarly refer to ethical and moral actions which are specifically meant for the forms of behavior conducive for pleasant form of rebirth, heaven, sagga, and unpleasant form of rebirth, dugati. Apaya, Niraya, respectively. So if you take Punya and Papa, basically Punya helps you to be born in the Sagga, and then uh, Papa leads you to Duggati. Duggati, Apaya, and Niraya. So if you look at these uh, three terms, uh, Duggati. Gati means form of birth. Duggati means uh, unpleasant form of birth. Niraya, and apaya, apa aya, nir aya. Aya means uh, income or the what you get, uh, uh, good things. So apa aya means uh, the away from good things. Niraya means uh, uh, absence of good things. So apaya, niraya, uh, dugati uh, are related to uh, papa. These two concepts are closely connected to the idea of sansara <coughs> and the doctrine of karma, which mainly deals with the good, punya kam and evil, papa kam, actions that result in present and unpleasant forms of existence, bhava in the sansara. Now, this aspect is very important when you talk about punya and papa. Basically, punya and papa refer to the sansara. Okay? Punya and papa refer to the sansara. 
Now, for example, if you, as a result of Punya, if you are born in Sagga, that means still in the Sansara. And as a result of Papa, if you are born in Apaya, that is definitely within the Sansara. Now, in other words, the distinction is this. Distinction is this. Whether it is Punya or Papa, you are talking about within the Sansara. So, within the Sansara, you are born in a good place. Within the Sansara, you are born in a bad place. Okay? But the basic thing is within the Sansara. Now, this is something very important because in Buddhism, as you know, uh, ultimate goal is to go away from Sansara. Right? So, we can say that Punya helps you to be in the Sansara. Papa, of course, keeps you in the Sansara in an unpleasant manner. Now, you know, here lies the basic distinction. Now, if you really want to be uh, going away from Sansara, then, of course, you can say Punya is not applicable to you, right? You know, this is the basic idea. So, whether it is Punya or Papa, you are within the Sansara. So, your Sansara will be very happy if you do more Punya. And then your Sansara will be very unhappy if you do more Papa. But of course, the fact remains that you are still within the Sansara. For example, it's something like this. You are within a prison. You are within a prison. But of course, you know, people can get together and do many things to beautify the prison. You can whitewash the prison and you can have flower uh, gardens within the prison. But of course, everything is within the prison, right? We are not outside the prison. But, you know, if you are really interested in going outside the prison, you don't care about beautifying the prison. Because you just want to go outside it. You just don't want to be inside it. So you don't want to make prison a happy place. You understand the difference? So the punya, punya is something like you are trying to beautify the prison. You are within the prison, you try to make it as happy as possible. Now in the Buddhist tradition, now generally uh, there is a distinction between Gahatta and Pabbajita. Household people and those who have left behind the household life. Now for the Ghatas, in the Buddhist tradition, mostly it is Sagga, right? Mostly it is Sagga, the heaven. So that means these householders, you know, getting away from Sansara is not very easy. So the option is for them to make Sansara as comfortable as possible, right? Okay, that is the idea. So these two concepts are closely connected to the idea of Sansara. And the doctrine of karma, which mainly deals with the good and bad. So the idea of sansara, alone with sansara, you have the doctrine of karma. Karma and rebirth. You, you accumulate karmas, you perform karmas, accordingly you reap, uh, you know, the results. So, you know, these two concepts, when you talk about punya papa, basically it is uh, the within the sansara and also within sansara, you are talking about the concept of uh, karma. The concepts kusala and nagusala are not used in the pre-Buddhist tradition in a similar ethical sense. Now, one thing to note important is um, uh, the kusala and nakusala in this sense are used only in Buddhism. It doesn't mean that the two terms kusala and nakusala were not there before the Buddha. They were there. But of course, they were used in this ethical sense. Because when you take kusala, basically, uh, look at what it is. In Buddhism, these two concepts are used to refer to the actions guided by the unwholesome mental states of attachment, anger, and delusion. Lobadosa moha. And those guided by their opposite wholesome characteristics, aloba, adosa, amoha. Now, here you see something very interesting. Uh, kusala and nakusala are defined. Kusala is what is guided by aloba dosa moha. Akusala is what is guided by loba dosa moha. So, now this is an important psychological explanation. Okay? 
Now, when we talk about Punya Papa, we were talking about basically the actions that are conducive for you to be born in the heaven. Oh, that will lead to the hell. But when we use the term Kusala and Nakusala, we are drawing a very important psychological distinction. Because whether something becomes Kusala or Akusala depends on whether in your mind you have Loba Dosa Moha or Aloba Adosa Amoha. Okay? Whether you have Loba Dosa Moha, Aloba Adosa Amoha. Now, Kusala and Nakusala in this manner are directly connected with psychological states which are identified in Buddhism as the major defilements which binds people into the sansara. Now, defilements which bind people to sansara. The absence or the presence of this mental state make an action kusala or akusala. Now, what are the defilements? Defilement means kilesa. If you take the word kilesa, the verb related to kilesa is Kilisati. That is the verb. Kilisati. Past participle is kilitta. So you can talk about kilitta chitta and the kilesa. Kilesa means defiling factors. Now these kilesas are the ones that connect you to sansara, that keeps you in the sansara. The kilesas are the things that keep you in the sansara. So the major defilements which bind beings into sansara, absence or the presence of these mental states. Now if you take lobodosa moha, those are the main things. But of course we know that only no, the, the, these three are not the only three. There are many others. Issa, Machir, Kukucha and you know so on in Dabidam you have all these um, uh, you know the various uh, Akusala Chetasikas. But then all these Akusala Chetasikas are included within Loba, Dosa and Moha. <coughs> Actually, even within these three, Moha is the prominent one. It is because of Moha you have Loba, Dosa. So ultimately, Loba, Dosa and Moha. So these are the three main Akusala concepts. So with these Akusala concepts, uh, if they are guided by uh, the akusalas, you know, then um, uh, actions become akusala. Uh, I mean, if they are guided by these characteristics, then they become akusala. So, uh, the major difference between these two sets of concepts is the following. Now, if you look at these two sets of concepts, the major difference is this. Kusala and nakusala are actions assessed from the point of view of nirvana or the release from suffering. Accordingly, actions guided by attachment, anger and delusion, that means Loba Dosa Moha, lead the doers to sansaric suffering. While the actions guided by absence of these characteristics lead the doer toward Nirvana, release from suffering. Now, Punya and Papa actions lead the doer to the sansara. While good actions cause samsaric existence to be pleasant by causing birth in the heavenly planes, the evil actions cause the sansaric existence to be unpleasant by causing birth in the unpleasant state. Now, here you see the basic distinction between Kusala and Akusala and Punya Papa. So, Kusala and Akusala are basically, we can say, connected to the sansara and then the uh, punya and papa are basically connected to the to, to nirvana. Okay? So, uh, in other words, while punya and papa are the ways of assessing ethical or moral value of actions from the sansaric point of view, kusala and nakusala are the ways of assessing human behavior from the nirvanic point of view. Punya and papa are relevant to those who wish to be born uh, to be in the sansara enjoying pleasures and avoiding unpleasant state. Kusala and Nakusala pertain to those who are striving to achieve freedom from the sansara. In this sense, Punya and Papa are relevant to the lay household people, Gahatsa, and Kusala and Nakusala are relevant to those who have left behind household life. Now here you can see fairly clearly the two sets of concepts have two different goals. 
So if you talk about uh, Punya and Papa, they are basically relevant to uh, those who are uh, willing to be uh, living a sansaric life, enjoying pleasures and avoiding unpleasant state. Now, Kusala Kusala pertain to those who are striving to achieve freedom from sansara. So, this is basically the thing. So, you do punya and papa, of course, you do punya and avoid papa because you want to be in the sansara. Uh, and then Kusala and Nakusala really lead into uh, uh, away from sansara, okay? But, you know, this concept has to be very carefully understood because otherwise, uh, when I make this kind of distinction, Sometimes you may yourself, uh, uh, you know, misunderstand this. Uh, now, we will go into a little bit uh, detail of this. When these two categories are explained in this manner, there arises a question about the moral status of Punya Act. For example, an act of donation, dana, is the leading Punya Act. Can one donate something with lobe? Obviously not. If dana is an act of alobe, is it not an act of kusala? Now, you know, this is a question. Now, we say that punya is for uh, sansara. Okay? Now, punya, if you look at the list of punyas, dasa punya kiriyavattu, ten meritorious deed, dana comes first. Generosity, giving comes first. Now the question is, now if dana is a kusala, if it is, I'm sorry, if dana is a punya, if it is not kusala, then are we saying that dana is performed or done with lobe? Now, you know, the psychologically this is very important because uh, you give something. Now, very act of giving involves a lobe. Because you give something, because you don't have lobe for that. But then how come it becomes punya, but not kusala? Or what is the meaning of saying that dana is a punya? Now, uh, what makes the difference here is for what purpose one performs this act of donation? Because one performs this action with the expectation of accumulating merits to be useful to future good births, Although one has allow before the things one donate, one at the same time has an expectation or lobe for the sansaric pleasures. Then it is an action both with and without lobe. Now, what it means is this. If you look at an action of uh, action such as dana, interesting thing is it, it is not really the dana act, but what is more important thing is uh, for what purpose you do this? For what purpose do you do dana? Now, if you do the dana in order to be born in the heaven, then you know what you have is uh, lobe, right? Desire, isn't it? If you perform a dana, if you give dana to be born in the heaven, I mean, you are donating something, giving something, in order to get something higher, isn't it? Uh, it's like this, you know, you are investing some money, maybe in future you want to get interest, right? So when you go to bank and deposit your money, if you get, uh, say, 10% or 15% um, uh, interest, is it an act of done? Are you giving your, donating your money to the bank? No, you are not donating your money to the bank. But of course, uh, you are giving that money to bank, depositing it, your money in the bank, because you know that after one year, you get um, 10 or 15 percent or whatever percentage as your interest. But of course, in order to get that interest for the time being, temporarily, you have to be away from your money. So you give and hand your money over to the bank, but you know, because you know, you are getting an interest. You know, this act of dana for the sansaric purpose is something like that. You are giving up, but at the same time you have some 
higher expectation in your mind. You believe that in future one day you will be born in the heaven and you know you will get so much uh, pleasures. So you know you part with your whatever the wealth you have for the moment. Now I am not saying this exactly like this. Actually, when people give dana, when you give dana, you have many 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 things. You know, we give dana to the monastery also to out of kindness to the monks and or the nuns and then in order to maintain the this institute and you know the places and in order to maintain the temple and you know all these things but the uh, interesting thing is we have an element of uh, selfishness there that element of selfishness is we are expecting something by by that act we expect monk or Siale to recognize the donors, you know, be nice to them. And then when they visit the monastery, of course, you know, they are very important people in the monastery because they are the big donors, isn't it? So also the donors expect some kind of recognition, some kind of recognition. Now, what is this recognition? Of course, you do something good, but at the same time, you expect some kind of recognition. Now, this recognition is aspect of lobe, okay? And also, finally, you expect to be, um, you know, the born in heaven. Now, that is again uh, uh, another aspect of lobe. So, you can see the as ordinary people, when you do this donating act, we, we have really mixed things. On the one hand, we have a lobe, but on the other hand, we have also lobe. So, lobe and alobe kind of uh, coming together. Now, according to Abhidhamma, this can happen. According to psychology, this can happen. Yeah, I mean, exactly, it is not like depositing money in the bank. But what, it, uh, what happens is, you know, you have both lobe and alobe. Both you have desire for the sansara. But out of desire for the sansara, you make donation. But the moment you donate, I mean, at least for that particular thing you are donating, you don't have um, attachment. So, you know, in that sense, it is, uh, it is allowable. So, the interesting thing is, you know, this is a subtle psychological uh, state, okay? When you do moral things, when you do good things, when you perform punya, very often you have some kind of your own self-centered, personal, in a way, selfish uh, desire. But, you know, then, uh, but it doesn't mean that, you know, this giving dana is wrong or anything, no. What it means is, you know, the complex situation, okay. So, uh, ultimately, we can say that uh, what makes a difference here is what purpose one performs this act of donation. Purpose is very important because one performs this action <laughs> with the expectation of accumulating merit to be useful for future good births, although one has a lobe for the things one donates, one at the same time has an expectation or lobe for the sansaric pleasures. Then it is an action both with and without lobe. In a way, you can say it is a, it is a kusalak, but at the same time, it is not a kusalak. But, you know, don't, don't misunderstand. This doesn't mean that punya acts are bad or you should not do punya or something. No. Actually, punya acts are the very ordinary level of our ethical behavior. It is a good thing to do. But here we are dealing with a very uh, high standard of uh, uh, Buddhist ethics where you distinguish between uh, punya and papa as samsaric virtues and then kusala and nakusala as nirvanic things. But because when it comes to nirvanic things, of course, you know, the, the way you calculate, way you look at these things is, you know, very different. So this may be stated in the following manner. All papa actions are both papa and akusala. But all punya actions are, actions become kusala or akusala or mixed in the manner one performs such actions. What do you think about this? Now, if you take punya and papa, kusala and nakusala, uh, now, it is very clear that if you take papa, all papa are akusala. 
can we agree with that we can say all pop actions are acusal actions okay so um, we will simply say that uh, we can agree with that so we can say uh, all pop actions are Accusal actions. Because when something to be papa, of course it has to have loba dosa moha. So, yeah, so therefore, papa and akusal, we can say, uh, we can say papa akusal. You know, papa akusal. But uh, on the other hand, all pop actions are accusal actions. But how if this? Okay. Uh, are all accusal actions pop? What do you think about that? Are all accusal actions pop? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> All accusal actions, Papa, think about it, think about it. Uh, now, when we say something is an accusal action, uh, accusal action by definition is if you do something with loba dosa moha. Okay? Now, Papa is, you know, it's not defined Papa, but you know, killing a human being. Killing a person is papa, stealing is papa, and so on. But you know, if you look at accusal actions, are all accusal actions papa? Because accusal actions are what we do with loba dosa moha. Put it differently. Now, um, if I buy an ice cream and eat it, what do I have in my mind? I mean, I, I get this ice cream and I eat the ice cream. What do I, I, I have in my mind? You have loba, right? Basically, you have loba, and if you have loba, you have moha, right? Maybe we can say uh, you don't have dosa, but of course, uh, if you buy an ice cream or if you keep a chocolate in your thing and you, know, you eat it secretly, what do you have it? <laughs> you have loba. Now, but is eating an ice cream is a papa? <laughs> Will you be born in Apai because of that? What do you think? Of course, you do something. Now, you know, not only eating ice cream or a chocolate, if you look at our ordinary life, isn't it the case that most of the things we do in our ordinary life are motivated by Lobodosa Moha? Why do we study here? To get a degree. Why do we get a degree? In order to attain nirvana or for what? Why do we get a degree? Why do we get a recognition? To be a big person in society, to be a big preacher in society, to be educated, to, 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 to be teaching in a big uh, college or something like that. So your education is motivated by lobe, is that right? You see? Pardon me? Okay, I will come to that, but here the question, my question is, are all accusal actions are papa? Okay, the, the question is, we, I will come to your question, but all accusal actions are papa. Now, the interesting thing is this, according to Buddhist analysis, ordinary human beings are behaving with lobodosa moha. But in our whole entire day-to-day -day life is lobodosa moha, isn't it? Why do you get married? Why do you have children? But do you go to hell because of, according to Buddhism, because you get married? Do you go to Apai because you have, you raise your children with so much love? But you know, when you have your love for your children or husband or wife, you have love for those more. Now, this is the interesting thing, because I think all akusal actions are not papa. Is that right? Can we agree with that? Because if all accusal actions are papa, 
then uh, according to Buddhism, you know, our whole life will be full of papa, right? We will not be able to live, right? I mean, if you even for a monk or siale or a lay person, our day-to-day -day life is, you know, uh, we are living with Lopadosa Moha, isn't it? <laughs> so do we want to say that it is papa? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> I think it is not papa. Because if it is Papa, you know, it will be a terrible situation because, you know, you will never be able to do anything. Like, you know, every time we eat something uh, good, tasty, we feel desire about it. I mean, that's very normal. And then uh, you want to um, dress beautifully. Um, of course, it applies to lay people, but even for the monks, you know, you want to have a good robe. And, you know, very well, well ironed and pressed uh, things, you know, you spend a lot of time ironing your things, isn't it? <laughs> so, even for Cialis, you know, it's kind of fashionable to, you know, have something. <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, the problem is, if all Akusala's actions are papa, uh, we will never be able to live without papa. Now, here is the distinction between, very important distinction between Papa and Akusala, okay? Because usually human life, according to Buddhist analysis, Puthujjana, ordinary worldling, is always Lobadosa Moha. In the long run, your motivations are Lobadosa Moha. As a householder, you study in a university, you get a degree in order to get a better job, better job for a better salary, better salary to live a good life. So you can say lobe. The problem is, you know, because of that, according to Buddhism, you don't go to Apai. Because, you know, you are, you are not doing a papa there. So the whole thing is, we can say, according to Buddhism, that your life motivated by Akusala is not for Nirvana. For example, you go to university, you get a degree in order to get a good job. So that is not for Nirvana. So, from Nirvanic point of view, that is Akusala, right? What is the meaning of Akusala? Kusala, Akusala. Kusalo means what? Karaniya matha kusalena. What is the Kusala there? Skillful, clever. So, Kusala person is clever person. Kusala means clever, skillful. So, clever means from the point of view of Nirvana, getting a degree is not clever. Okay, getting a degree is not kusala. Okay, so from the point of view of nirvana, but maybe from the point of view of sansar, getting a degree is kusala. You see, so here you see the distinction very clearly because <coughs> what Buddhism considers to be kusala and akusala is when you look from that point of view, you can see that you know the things become kusala or akusala, depending on the goal. So here we can say all papa actions are akusala, because all papa have lobadosa moha, right? <coughs> Sorry. But that doesn't mean that everything you do with lobadosa moha is papa. Do you see the kind of logical connection? Okay? You can say all papa is akusala, right? So we can say Papa is Akusala. But you know, on the other hand, we cannot say uh, Akusala equals Papa, no. Because <coughs> certain Akusala can be Papa, certain Akusala may not be Papa, right? So the connection between Papa and Akusala. So all Papa actions are Akusal action, but not vice versa. Not Akusal actions are papa. But about the punya. Now, how about punya? Now, here we see example is when we perform a dana. When you perform a dana, I said that dana has both lobe and nalobe. In a way, I don't have a lobe about the thing I give. But on the other hand, I have much larger lobe about to be born in the heaven. So, you know, that act, act, you know, so then here look at the, but if all punya actions become kusala, all punya actions can become akusala, all punya actions can become mix. 
what do you think punya actions can become kusala now for example if you really do a donation without any expectation right sometimes we have that you know we give something to unknown beggar we don't know who the person is we do sometimes things uh, without any expectations even though we are ordinary putajjana people there are some occasions we do things without any expectation now that can be a kusala act of course as a result of this kusala act it can also act as a punya because you are a ordinary putajjana as a result of that you will be born in heaven but of course you when you perform the action you don't have any expectation you know you simply do something you give something to a beggar on the road or you help somebody out of nowhere you know but then i still remember i remember one time i was actually um, um traveling in uh, i think england or something and then one man just gave me a ticket uh, train ticket he said look i bought this day ticket and but i am just going to airport now you can use it now i don't know his name he doesn't know my name he just gave me that and he went now what is that act that's i think kusala act because he doesn't expect anything because he doesn't know who me who i am he just saw somebody because he is not using this ticket for the rest of the day you can use the ticket for the rest of the day he said take it and he went nothing you don't know his name i don't he doesn't know my name uh, i just maybe said thank you but you know nothing beyond that but you know we do that kind of acts without any expectations right we do lot of now those things can be can say kusala acts okay but suppose we do something a good thing donation in competition to others <clears throat> okay we want to compete this year these people did we want to do we want to do better or something you know so we are competing with somebody else now that can be akusala so you are doing a good thing but of course with akusala thoughts you want to compete with somebody you want to get a better name you want to get better recognition so you know motivated by all these things competition desire and all these things so you have lobha dosa moha but what you do is really a good thing in a sense because you know that helps somebody else so you know and then but ordinarily i think if you take the ordinary puthujjana people well links what we do is basically mix things do you agree because you know we can't get away from our lobha dosa moha completely right so uh, we do things we we like if we get a good name for that but uh, if we don't get a good name we might be little bit upset but not much so you know like that you know life goes on you keep on doing good things you remember in one of the um, uh, discourses buddha was going on excuse me no your telephone so um in one of the discourses buddha says very clearly there are certain things uh sukkam sukka vipakam kanham kanna vipakam kanna sukkam kanna sukka vipakam faya karma dark karma faya and dark karma so there can be certain karmas faya they, they are really good looking karmas and then dark there can be some karma but then there can be kanha sukha kanha sukha vipaka there can be uh, actions both black and white and the vipaka is also both black and white now i think uh, if you look at ordinary mind we can't get rid of lobha dosa moha that easily maybe most of our actions belong to mixed in the manner one performs such actions so it can be mixed mix in the sense you know like how you uh, perform it so uh, when we discuss these key ethical concepts you know this distinction is something uh, very important uh, see in the connection so we can say something like this all we can say can we say this all kusala actions 
ആ പുഞ്ഞ് ബട്ട് നോട്ട് ഓൾ പുഞ്ഞ് ആക്ഷൻസ് ആ കുസല് ഡു യു അഗ്രി ഓൾ കുസൽ ആക്ഷൻസ് ആ പുഞ്ഞ് but not all punya actions are kusala yes or no <laughs> huh? what do you think can we agree that all uh, kusala actions become punya i mean if you do something without lobado samoha that is uh, kusala action it can also become say for example if you are not an arahant if you are not an arahant then it can become a punya for you right because you are in the sansar isn't it can why not anyway come up come up with your ideas you don't have to agree with me i am saying this because nobody disagreeing with me but you can disagree with me <laughs> what do you think now kusala actions are punya at least for the ordinary people putujjana people if you can do a kusala action something without lobha dosha moha of course by definition you are putujjana because you always have lobha dosha moha but at least temporarily if you can do something without lobha dosha moha maybe not 100% so okay as a putujjana you can't be completely away from lobha dosha moha at all then maybe you are you can't do a complete kusala action can we decide like that as putujjanas we can never do complete kusala actions right because how can you get rid of lobha dosha moha if you can get rid of lobha dosha moha then you are not a putujjana right come on what do you think <laughs> what do you think can you say all kusal actions are punya say it again sir uh, all kusal actions are punya i can say yes and no why do you say yes so arias who are not arahants can yes. perform that's what you say yes. okay uh huh um, arahan they they make the kudala action but they are the uh, we can say punya and kriya yeah that's yeah. why i deny so okay so your your answer is okay that's a good answer so what you say is like sotapanna sakadagami anagami that type of arya puggala can be making kusala also punya yeah, yeah, yeah. okay but, but well, arahant yeah yeah I, i get the point i get the point so arahant whatever does arahant is uh, not really punya but you know do, okay that's that's a good answer don't misunderstand it doesn't mean that arahant are not doing what we consider to be punya karma arahant are doing those things it does not mean that arahants don't donate they donate like anybody else but only thing is it doesn't become uh, what is called opadhika punya actually i think I, i i come to that point later so we can say all kusal actions are punya uh, yes and no yeah. <laughs> okay but about but not all punya actions are kusala can we agree with that not all punya actions are kusala all punya actions are not kusala can we agree yes all punya actions are not kusala what do you think about that what do you what do you think about this whole thing huh? anybody has any idea huh? anybody has any idea 
Yeah, because when you say something is punya, as I said, punya actions can be all, uh, I'm sorry, all punya actions can be kusala, akusala, or mixed. If that is true, we can agree with that not all punya actions are kusala, because some punya actions can be both kusala and akusala. Some punya actions can be really akusale even, okay, depending on uh, the way you do. So, all punya actions, we can say not are, something like this could be, <laughs> not exactly, but you know, we kind of water it down, okay, we kind of water it down. So, all kusala actions could be punya, we water it down a little bit. But not all punya actions are kusala. Okay. Now you see the distinction is this. Distinction is this. It is it is how we understand this. So basically the kusala concepts are dependent on the psychological analysis. It's on our mind. Punya actions are also like that. But because punya is what is considered to be the samsaric thing. We have a larger concept within because we are in sansara. Now, you know, ethically, this is a very challenging thing for Buddhism. Why it is challenging thing for Buddhism? Because somebody can say that, look, according to Buddhism, we are always doing Nakusala. Because all the Putujjanas have Lobodosa Moha. Then that means that all the Putujjanas are always with Akusala. That is why I think we need to make this distinction very clear. Although it can be akusala, it is not papa. You know, it is not morally wrong. Because as, as ordinary uh, worldlings, you know, we, we, we have love those, more attachment, uh, anger and delusion we have. I mean, in order to get rid of these things, we try. But although we try, we have these things. So, in a sense, we can say that Putujjana life is Akusala life. We have these things. But of course, in the, in the, in the life, as you said, uh, the, 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 the life of the Sotapanna, I mean the life of the Sakadagami is better than Sotapanna. Life is Anagami is better than Sakadagami. And the Kalyana Putajjana life is better than ordinary Putajjana. You know, so like that, you know, we can have... Uh, many different uh, grades within that. But uh, when we say that a Putajjana life is a Akusala life, of course, we don't need to be frightened about it because Akusala means basically Loba Dosa Moha. So we are with Loba Dosa Moha. We can't get rid of that. So in a way, we can say any form of Akusala life is not good for Nirvana. So we give this definition Akusala, not clever or not skillful simply with reference to nirvana. But on the other hand, in Buddhism, if you look at the household life, household life always Buddha described as ghi sukha. You know, you are looking at the happiness in the lay life and uh, in order to get this happiness, uh, you live that life, you earn money. I mean, earning money is always lobha. But you know, within that lobha, earning money, you can do it in a good manner. Suppose you are, a, you are selling something, you are doing business for your living, you don't do bad things for your business. But still you, you want to make money, you want to make a profit. That's, otherwise you don't do business. But when you do a business, you do it in a good manner. You get a reasonable profit, not too much profit. So you can be within limited lobadosa moha. In other words, you can be limiting your lobe dosa moha, but you can't get rid of. So in, the, in, the, in that manner, we can say it is akusara life. But on the other hand, it is not a papa life. It's not papa. So if you are doing basic things and you are still within the sansara. So you can see there are two levels of morality here. These two concepts are understood in you know, two different uh, degrees. So in that sense, we can say that uh, uh, all pop actions are both pop and akusala, but all punya actions become kusala or akusala or mixed in this manner, uh, depending on how one performs uh, uh, this action. The Buddha and the Arahant who are freed from 
the sansara do not require to do or have punya they do not do any papa or akusala because their attachment anger and delusions have naturally been eradicated so you know the buddha and arahant do not need uh, uh, punya in one discourse buddha says uh, anumattena pi punyena atho maihan navijjati what is the meaning of that anumattena pi punyena atho maihan navijjati anumattena pi punyena i do not need even the smallest punya why you are not in the sansara so buddha says that i do not need even the smallest punya okay because you are not in the sansara you don't want to be born again you know so that's why and then uh, they do not do any papa o akusala now arahant don't do any papa no do they any akusala because their attachment anger and delusion have naturally been eradicated everything they do is kusala because whatever they do they don't have lobha dosa moha they brush their teeth wash their face they go for pinda path they eat they do all the ordinary things but no lobha dosa moha so it is kusala but not punya even when they do things that are usually considered <coughs> as punya sorry their actions become kusala because they do not have expectation nor desire about sansaric existence so even when they do things that are usually considered as punya i, I said that earlier also arahant can be doing what we consider to be punya now arahant can donate something to somebody can't he he can arahant teach dhamma desana isn't it a punya kam arahant guide people so all these are regularly punya kam but when arahant do they are not punya but they are kusala but they do i mean ordinary society consider to be certain things to be punya arahant do all these good things now buddha lived his entire life teaching that means dhamma desana you can say so you can say it is punya but for the buddha it is not a punya it is a is a kusala for an arahant it is a kusala so you see the distinction so everything they do is kusala act even when they do things that are usually considered as punya their actions become kusala because they do not have expectation or desire about the sansaric existence now it is wrong to hold that the arahant do not do things that are usually considered good acts in teaching the dhamma to others in showing the path to sagga and mokkha in giving things in helping others arahant do good things the difference is that by doing so they do not desire for sansaric existence they do not perform opadhika punya now i I'm, i think you know this concept opadhika punya that means punya acts that lead to sansaric existence okay so uh, arahants do not do uh, uh, opadhika punya so uh, um let me move into the very last one uh, it is wrong to say that an arahant is beyond good and bad in the sense that morality is not applicable to such person the arahant is not beyond but away from akusala and punya and papa but not away from kusala do you see the uh, distinction i mean as i said at the very beginning when you say arahant is beyond good and bad it gives the meaning that arahant doesn't have to care about good and bad that is wrong because although arahant doesn't have definitely papa and nakusala also arahant doesn't have punya but arahant has kusala kusala means arahant behavior is characterized by alobha adosa and namo okay so alobha adosa and namo behavior is not beyond good and bad actually arahant life is within what is 
called good in the highest sense, kusala. Okay. In other words, Buddha and Arahamsa are not away from kusala. So Arahanthood is the, you know, the perfect kusala state, but not punya. So it is wrong to say that an Arahant is beyond good and bad in the sense that morality is not applicable to such person. Arahant is not beyond, but away from Makusala. Now, there is a difference between when you say beyond Akusala and away from Makusala. When you say Arahant is beyond Akusala, that means Arahant can even do Akusala, but it doesn't matter. That is wrong. But you can say Arahant is away from Makusala. Okay? And Punya and Papa, but not away from Kusala. The life of the Buddha and the Arahant are characterized by Kusala. Arahanthood is the perfect state of Kusala. Actually, in the Majjhima, if you look at this, uh, <coughs> you can see that uh, it is, so Arahant life is Kusala. The life of a liberated person may be said to be beyond good, only in the sense that such a person does not accumulate Punya. You can say Arahant life is beyond good, only in the sense that the Punya doesn't, is Punya is not applicable. But, you know, Punya the, the good in the sense punya is only one meaning, of, but good has a much broader meaning. So the life of a liberated person may be said to be beyond good only in the sense that such a person does not accumulate punya. The Buddha and the Arahants, once they attain the goal, will spend their life helping and guiding human beings, beings and attain freedom from suffering. So in other words, actually Buddha and Arahant, when you become an Arahant, you spend the rest of your life helping others. Now helping others is really in the ordinary sense Punya Karma. But for an Arahant, Arahant is doing it, not expecting anything next birth or anything. So therefore for the Arahant, it becomes Punya Karma. Okay, okay uh, I think uh, we, we, I will wind up uh, from this, but basically what I wanted to show you is uh, these two very important Buddhist uh, pair of concepts, Punya Papa and Kusala Kusala, how they are connected, okay? Very often we tend to understand these things as interchangeable. In literature, in some places, they have been used interchangeably, it's true, but if you look at carefully, particularly if you read Professor P. D. Premasiri's research, uh, you can see that these two concepts have a very important uh, distinction. Okay. Maybe we will spend, uh, time is 11 o'clock, but we can spend maybe five minutes or something if you have any questions. Yes, sir, go ahead. You next. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, Arahant, when Arahant gives, it is not a Punya, because Punya in the sense, Arahant is not doing it with the expectation of uh, any good name or anything. Arahant does it because it is a good thing to do. So it is a Kusala thing. Now, the distinction between Kusala and Punya uh, depends on how you do that. You give a gift, uh, expecting something in return, even a good name, then it becomes a punya because it has a lobe. So but it's when. Ar it's in punya, behind the punya, there are some expectations to give something. Exactly, exactly. You are an ordinary putujjana, you do it with loba dosa moha. But when an arahant does something, a loba dosa moha, it doesn't, it doesn't become a punya really because it becomes a kusala. It's, it's a good, skillful act, but not an expectation. So the distinction is really whether you do something with motivated by subtle lobe. Uh, so I have a question. Next yeah, time. yeah, yeah. What is the difference in good designer and lobe? Well, so because uh -huh. in some story, some of the Arahas, they have a good designer, 
uh, to by doing their good thing, like a phonia. Behind the phonia, they have a good desire uh, to be pleasure for the little body. But the, I, I'm not pleased in my brain. So well, the, uh, the, the venerable. Okay, I, I get your question. Yeah. The the concept of you know, good desire actually, you can understand several different ways. Say, for example, we talk about chanda, chitta, virya, vimansa. Now, what is chanda? Chanda is not really lobe, but unless you have chanda, you can't attain nirvana. You, you don't practice, right? So, chanda is also, chanda is desire, but chanda is desire, but chanda is not lobe, right? Yeah. So, until you attain nirvana, you have to have chanda. Otherwise, you will not attain nirvana. So, that's a good desire, example for good desire. But when it comes to an arahant, you, I mean, you can't say that whether he has good desire or bad desire, because simply he has, he can have chanda to do something. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it is not motivated by loba dosa moha. So any form of behavior, because by definition, arahant is a person who doesn't have loba dosa moha, right? Arahant doesn't have loba dosa moha. So whatever he does, he do, whatever he does is kusala in that sense. But whatever we do, mostly punya, but very occasionally, we can be doing something without any expectation, without any lobe, you, you see. So in a Putajjana life, my understanding is uh, occasion for complete kusala is very limited. But we do, we do punya really. So that's the basic distinction thing. Yes, Reverend, we will go to your question. You mean householder? How can the householder? Didn't get that quite. Now your question is how? They kill a lot of animals. They kill. They kill. Okay. A lot of animals. A lot of people. Okay. After that, they will fall off the poor who could stay. They will follow. They will fall off in the poor who could stay. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, they, how can we do two weeks from the school to stay? <laughs> okay, the Reverend, uh, no, no, I, I know. I mean, that's, that's a difficult question because, you know, the, in the household life, uh, say, for example, you know, killing. Uh, actually, you know, the killing, very clear that according to... Uh, Teaching of the Buddha, you know, it is uh, it is the first, you know, the violation of, you know, and then killing is a very bad uh, papa come, and you know the, but but the thing is this, uh, sometime you know even in the Buddhist society, now you know that uh, you know any 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 society, even though you don't kill, but you know we, we eat uh, pork and all these things, right? <laughs> so somebody is killing for us, so we don't kill, so you know in a society, you know. Sometime living in the sansara, it is not very easy to get away from all the wrong things. That's why ultimately Buddha says, get rid of sansara. Because so long as you are in the sansara, there are certain things, you know, you have to be responsible. So the person who kills is very responsible. People who are eating is also responsible to some extent, right? So, you know, the, the, we can't really get away from the responsibility. But the degree of responsibility can be different. Okay. So the Buddhist position has to be ultimately, uh, you know, the get rid of it completely. But if you cannot do it completely, you do it gradually. You know, not you know. This this is the basic thing for the lay people. Lay people will not be able to live a completely a moral life. But you know, there are different degrees. Some people can be living. A, much higher moral life, some people much less moral life, you know, it depends on, you know. 
So uh, ultimately, if you ask from the Buddha, Buddha would say, that is why I say you attain Nirvana. <laughs> okay, uh, Venerable I think time is passing, so we will wind up. In the afternoon, we will meet for our world religion discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.